Hello again, and welcome to the 2021 Ole Miss Choral Symposium. I'm Don Trott, Director of Choral Activities here at the University of Mississippi. I'm delighted as we continue our five-part series titled Performing Renaissance Music, a Virtual Symposium on Historical Performance. Tonight, we are presenting part three, Meter and Tempo. On behalf of the University of Mississippi, I welcome you, and now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Dennis Schrock. Thank you, Dr. Trott. For this third video, we turn to meter and tempo and deal with some very practical, tangible, and consequential aspects of performance. And we learn more do's and don'ts from primary sources of the Renaissance era, mostly more do's, more freedoms about performance, more possibilities to make the music accessible and enjoyable. Looking back momentarily and recalling some of these freedoms, in the first video that dealt with sources and forces, we encountered the practice of si placet, as you please, being able to perform selected parts of a composition depending upon the resources we might have available. Performing a piece scored for SSATB for just SSA, or even just two soprano parts, and being able to have the other parts played by a lute or organ, harpsichord. In the second video that dealt with sound and pitch, we learned that we were able to select a pitch level that put a piece in comfortable ranges for the singers and that gave us an ethos of quality that brightened the music and kept it stable, kept it from going flat. And we also learned that we could transpose music to suit our needs, thus opening up an entire new realm of repertoire for us. For this third video, dealing with meter and tempo, we learn about yet a more welcoming possibility, the freedom to vary tempo. But first, as in the previous videos, I must subject you to visual arts of the Renaissance in my effort to relate the visual and aural arts, and to further my stance that the music of the time is just as rich and expressive as the other arts. For this video, those other arts being paintings, machinery, and plays. And all of them, we focus on movement. Many paintings of the Renaissance are of people. Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, or of fixed scenes, the many paintings of the Madonna and Child. But there are also paintings that show action, which is the case in two very well-known and famous works of art. The first is Botticelli's Primavera, painted in the 1470s and displayed in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. For movement, we see on the right Zephyr, the god of the West, painted in blue, chasing the nymph Chloris. And in the left center of the painting, we see the three dancing graces, their translucent dresses moving in the breeze. Above, among the oranges, is Cupid in the process of shooting his arrow of love. The second painting is Botticelli's The Birth of Venus, painted in the mid-1480s, and also displayed today in the Uffizi Gallery. Here we see Venus, the Roman goddess of love and beauty, emerging from the sea and standing in a giant scallop shell. Her hair and the dress she is being given are flowing in the wind created by Zephyr, the god of wind, who is carrying Aura, goddess of breezes. We also see considerable movement in the paintings of peasant life by Peter Briegel, the elder. In children's games, painted in about 1560, and now in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, we see in the lower center of the painting, children rolling hoops. In the lower left center, riding hobby horses. In the mid center, playing leapfrog and in the fenced area on the left, performing handstands. And in Wedding Dance in the Open Air, painted in about 1566, and now in the Detroit Institute of the Arts, 
we see many of Bruegel's paintings of outdoor revelry. Here, more than a hundred guests are dancing enthusiastically with obvious great vigor, overexcited by the looks of the cod pieces. We also see or sense movement in many of the sketches by Leonardo da Vinci, who was fascinated by how objects could be transported from one place to another. Here, we see in one drawing a machine that could lift heavy objects, and in another drawing, one of his flying machines, this one being what we presume to be a sort of helicopter. And beyond the purely visual, it is important that I mention theater and the playwright in reviewing the arts of the Renaissance. And in so doing, we come to Christopher Marlowe, the contemporary of William Shakespeare, both being born in the same year, 1564. Here is a cover of Marlowe's play, The Troublesome Reign and Lamentable Death of Edward II, King of England, with the Tragical Fall of Proud Mortimer, written in 1494. And here we see the beginning of Shakespeare's Hamlet, written between 1599 and 1601. So in review of the visual arts, the Botticelli paintings represent mythical personas. The Bruegel paintings have mannered de depictions. The Leonardo drawings show imaginary images and the plays are of historical accounts but they all also represent the natural phenomenon of music. And as we turn to movement in music, we must first deal with meter. In video one, I showed these four mensuration signs that identified meter during the medieval and Renaissance eras. And I made the point that the fourth sign, the C, does not stand for common time or four beats per measure, as it did in later historical eras, but for two beats per measure, as clearly defined, tempus imperfectum prolatio minor. So when we see the C meter in modern day editions, as we do here in William Byrd's familiar motet, Ave Verum Corpus, we shouldn't think of four beats per measure. Or when we see an edition with four four, we should ignore it with the understanding that the editor of the edition was simply ignorant of original meter signatures and their meanings. We should also understand that there was no 4-4 at all during the Renaissance era. This is true for Bird's Mass for Four Voices, which, as you can see in the original manuscript, has a C meter signature and which should be transcribed into two as shown in the first edition here, not in 4.4 as printed below it. But more important than either 2 or 4 is the meter's establishment of tactus and the regular movement of that tactus, a movement that is consistent in its durational value throughout a composition or consistent and not changed until a new meter signature is given. This regularity is explained in a number of treatises. The first quote here is by the Italian theorist Giorgio Anselmi, also known as Anselmus de Parma, who wrote in his treatise De Musica of 1434, it is not that a fixed mensura cannot surpass its limitations. It can be greater and then again lesser, that is to say faster and slower, as determined by a cantor. But within these limitations, the tactus cannot be changed to longer and shorter durations. The second quote is from the treatise of 1540, De Arte Canendi, The Art of Singing, by Sebald Hayden, who wrote, Tactus is a movement or stroking of a finger that fits the value of all notes and rests into an equally divided temporal beat. 
And the third quote is by Thomas de Santa Maria, who wrote in his treatise of 1565, all tactus are measured and regulated by the length of the first tactus. That is, the amount of time occupied by the first tactus is occupied by each of the ones that follow so that no more time elapses in one than in the other. From these quotes, we learn that we shouldn't change or vary the notated meter of a composition, which, by the way, would have been impossible when reading from choir books, with each voice part located on a different section of the page, or when reading from part books, with each singer able to only see his or her voice part. One couldn't have a tactus for one part and a different one simultaneously for another part. One simply could not vary the lengths of a tactus or measures as seen here in a current edition of Palestrina's Stop at Mater. We know why some people today believe in changing bar lengths, called rebarring by those who practice it, Bars are changed so as to locate ordinarily stressed words or syllables on beats, not between them. The placing of the words or syllables between beats causing syncopation. But syncopation was a natural and valued aspect of performance during the Renaissance. In 1412, the theorist Prostocimos Beldomandis wrote in his treatise, Mensural Music in the Italian Matter, syncopation is the sweetest thing to be found in a piece of music. Sebald Hayden wrote in his singing treatise of 1540, syncopation is generally considered to transpire whenever the mensural values of notes are sung for some time in opposition to the uniform movement of the tactus. Our succinct advice here concerning this discrepancy is as follows. Do not allow the note values to return to agreement with the tactus, but persist vigorously in the disparity until the notes are reconciled to the tactus. And furthermore, Thomas de Santa Maria concurs with the statement, syncopations that occur because of the regularity of the tactus should not be avoided. Syncopations don't hinder the conveyance of text, they make it more expressive. When editors or conductors try to rebar the music and take away syncopation, the music becomes bland and in a way it becomes unexpressive. In looking again at Palestrina's Stabat Mater with a consistent tactus, we find quite a few syncopations that serve to express the text, which translates as, there stood the mother grieving beside the cross weeping while on it hung her son, who saddened soul, sighing and suffering, pierced through with a sword. As I speak the soprano parts, note especially the three consecutive syncopations at the end of the example here, those to the words per transivit gladius, pierced with a sword. Stabat mater dolorosa juxta cutem lacrimosa Tum pendebat filius, cuius animam gemente. Contristatem et dolentem per transivit gladius. Frequent and similar occupations occur in William Byrd's Ave Verum Corpus, which has the comparable text, Hail, true body, 
born of the Virgin Mary, who has suffered truly, was sacrificed on the cross for mankind, whose side was pierced and flowed with blood. Be for us a foretaste when in death we are examined. Here I'm speaking the soprano part with a consistent tactus. Ave verum corpus natum de Maria Virgine vere passum immolatum in cruce Pro omine, cuius latus perforatum, unda fluxit sanguine, sanguine. Esto nobis pregustatum, in mortis examine. The three consecutive syncopations at the end of the major section of music to the words in mortis examine, in death we are examined, create a palpable tension that is used as an expressive device by many composers, including Palestrina in his Stabat Mater. And, by the way, the arrangement of multiple consecutive syncopations at the end of major sections of music was common with both Palestrina and Byrd and many other composers of the Renaissance era. Expressive syncopations also abound in Vittoria's popular motet, Vera Languoras Nostros, with the text from Isaiah 53, 4-5, truly our weaknesses he alone has borne, and our sorrows he himself has carried, and through his stripes we were healed. Sweet wood, sweet nails, sweet heavy tree, which alone was found worthy to bear the King of heaven and our Lord. Here is a performance of the motet by the Santa Fe Desert Chorale.
we shouldn't try to avoid syncopations by altering and varying the meter and regular flow of taktus and putting all naturally stressed or accented words or syllables on the taktus. We should embrace the syncopations that the composers wrote into the music, and we should love them for the expressiveness they create in performance. Also related to meter and taktus is the issue of tempo proportions or tempo relationships between two differing meters that occur in the same composition. First, we turn to John Dunstable's Quam Pulcra S, which has the circle mensuration sign, Tempus Perfectum Prolatio Minor, at the beginning of the motet, and the half circle sign with a dot in its center, Tempus Imperfectum Prolatio Major, later on in the motet. The circle can be transcribed as 3-2, and the half circle with a dot, which occurs in measure 39 of the score here, as 6-4. We don't know exactly how the tempo of one meter compares to the other because there is no commentary in primary sources of the Renaissance era as to tempo proportions. No commentary whatsoever. Tempo, as you will hear momentarily, was simply to be based on the expressive delivery of musical character. However, it seems natural and structurally comfortable if one has a consistent inner pulse that connects the two sections. That is, the quarter note of the 3-2 meter equates relatively to the quarter note of the 6-4 section. Here is what this sounds like as sung by our symposium singers. As another example, we can look at the motet Ave Maria, formerly ascribed to Victoria, but believed to have been composed by Jakob Handel instead. Here is a performance by the Santa Fe Desert Chorale. Note that we begin with a chant, not composed by Handel, and that I slow the tempo in measures 17 and 18 for, re for reasons of expressivity that is before the change of meter. However, the consistency of the quarter note can easily be heard from measures 30 to 31. Note also that the chorale sings repeated passage of music with different levels of volume. 
again for expressive reasons. And as a final example of the many tempo proportions that exist throughout the Renaissance era, I'll talk through Orlando di Lasso's Frottola Tutto lo di. Observe that the 2 2 or alla breve meter is conducted with two half notes per measure and the 3 4 meter with one dotted half note per measure, and as such, the duration of one toctus is different from the other although consistent throughout the duration of the meter. Observe also that the tempos of the two meters are bound together by the regular movement of the internal subdivision, the consistency of the quarter note. I also want to point out that the repeat of musical phrases is at a softer level of volume and that I relish the syncopations in measures 17 through 19. Tutto lo di, tutto lo di, tutto lo di mi dici canta, canta. Tutto lo di, tutto lo di, tutto lo di mi dici canta, canta. Non vedi che non posso, non vedi che non posso refiatare, ah, 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 che tanto cantare. Voria, voria, che mi dice si sono, 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 sono. Non le campana nona, non le campana nona. Non le campana nona, non le campana nona. Ma so cimballo tuo, o se compori ro 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 ne, o se compori ro 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 ne. So taggio, so taggio, so taggio sotto stone, so taggio, so taggio. So, taggio sotto 
たすとね。One is not obliged to have this sort of tempo proportion between two meters, one in which the measure is divided into two and the other in which the measure is divided into three. But the proportion of a consistent inner pulse does seem to be logical, especially in establishing tempos that are neither too fast nor too slow for the meters and for the expression of text or character that the meters serve, which is our ultimate goal. And so we turn to the choice of tempo for a composition and to the variation of that tempo within the composition. And as we explore this, Keep in mind the difference between changing a durational value of a tactus or beat, which we shouldn't do, and increasing or decreasing the speed of the tactus, which we have every license to do based on the expressive character of the music we are performing. We begin, of course, with guidelines and recommendations from primary sources, and of these, quotes from two sources that address the overall tempo of a composition based upon its nature, character, or mood. The first, by Alonso de Mudara, in his 1546 collection of pieces for the vihuela, which is a guitar-like instrument, entitled Tre Libros de Musica, he states, If a text is of gay and merry content, the tactus of necessity is to move merrily and quickly. And if another text is neither all gay nor all sad, this text will require another tactus, one that moves neither very quickly nor very slowly, and neither more nor less. That text which is sad throughout will demand the slow tactus. The second quote from Giuseppe Zarlino's Harmony Treatise of 1558 states, Singers should faithfully render the intent of the music, intoning the correct steps, adjusting to the harmonies, and singing in accord with the nature of the words. Happy words will be sung happily and at a lively pace, whereas sad texts call for the opposite. But there are also quotes that address changes of tempo within a composition. First, is from Niccolo Vicentino in his 1555 treatise. Sometimes one proceeds in a composition in a manner that is not notated, such as singing piano and forte, or presto and tardo, moving the tempo to demonstrate the passion of the words. A composition sung with variations of tempo is much more pleasing in its variety than one sung in an unvaried manner. Changes of tempo in a composition are not at all vexing. The practice of the orator teaches this, for we see how he proceeds in a speech. Now he speaks loudly, now softly, slower and faster. And this way of changing tempo has an effect on the mind. So one should sing music a la mente, to imitate the accents and effects of an oration. For what effect would the orator make if he recited a speech without arranging his pronunciations with fast and slow movement, softly and loudly? That would not move his hearers. And the second quote from Michael Pretorius in his Syntagma Musicum, or Musici, of 1619, to use by turns now a slower, now a faster beat in accordance with the text of a composition lends dignity and grace to a performance and makes it admirable. Motets and concertos are particularly delightful when after some slow and expressive phrases, several quicker phrases follow, then succeeded in turn by slow and stately ones which again give way to faster ones. In order to avoid monotony, one should thus, where led by the expression of the text, vary the pace. When using by turn slower and quicker beats according to the meaning of the text, 
music is given a majesty and grace and is adorned in a most marvelous manner. Changes of tempo may seem arbitrary and of relative insignificant consequence, but in some cases, a change of tempo is actually obligatory. For example, one cannot maintain the same tempo throughout the English anthem, rejoice in the Lord always, without considerable frustration and displeasure. The first part of the anthem to the text, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, clearly suggests a fast tempo. The second part of the anthem, however, has the contrasting text, let your softness be known unto all men, suggesting a slow or slower tempo. When modern day performers try to take the second section in the same fast tempo as the opening section, which they inevitably do, the music doesn't make sense, and one simply wants to avoid the anthem altogether. But this second section, taken at a slow tempo, reveals the anthem's innate expressive beauty. Here is the anthem with the first section complete at a fast tempo and the opening of the second section sung at a slow tempo. Meanwhile, the double bar you see that divides the two section is in the anthem's original manuscript, but is unfortunately absent from virtually all current, edition, current editions except the one I did, published by GIA. Let your softness be known unto all men. Let your softness be known unto all men. It is also mandatory to change tempos in the Gloria of Hassler's Misa Dixit Maria and in the Gloria of virtually every other Renaissance Mass setting. Double bars most often divide the movement into two parts. The second part beginning with the text, Qui tollis peccato mundi miserere nobis, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. And in most instances, the harmonic motion of this section, as well as the nature of the text, demands a slower tempo than the first section of the movement. We just have to be aware of this and committed to a change of tempo. But there often are no other double bars to help us change text, especially in the final portion of the movement, beginning with the text, quoniam tu solo sanctus, for you alone are holy. This portion seeming to require a return to a fast tempo. And there are other changes of tempo that one might want to implement in order to highlight the expressive nature of the text. Here is a performance of the Gloria by Via Veritate with illustrative tempo changes. Not necessarily changes that are obligatory, except for the beginning of the Quitolis, but tempo changes that are possibilities.
For a final example, we turn to consideration of tempo variation in Vittoria's motet Duo Seraphim, which is in two parts, divided by a double bar. The first part is set to the text from Isaiah 6.3, Two seraphim proclaimed one to another, Holy, Lord God of the Sabbath, the earth is full of his glory. The second part of the motet is set to the text from 1 John 5.7, There are three who give testimony in heaven, Father and Word and Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Then Vittoria repeats the end of part one, Holy, Lord God of the Sabbath, the earth is full of his glory. So the motet is in an A, B, C, B form. It was originally scored for SSAA, but I transposed it down a fifth for performance by the men of the Santa Fe Desert Chorale. And it occurred to me as we rehearsed that the end of the B sections the section of music set to the text Gloria Aeus, his glory, wanted to move faster, which is what we did and what you'll hear. But in addition to the tempo changes, I want you to note four other things. First, our attempt to match vocal timbres between the two tenor and two bass parts that are in the same ranges. Second, the many syncopations in the music, Third, the original fermata at measure 38. And fourth, the triple meter in measures 48 to 51. These measures bound together by a uniform movement of the quarter note pulse. <laughs>
In summary, primary sources of the Renaissance era give us clear indications for meter and tempo. As for meter, we should maintain the durational value of the tactus within each meter signature and appreciate the syncopations that result. Syncopations being the sweetest things to be found in a piece of music. As for tempo, we should set tempos based on a composition's character, and we should feel free and even desire to alter the tempo to highlight the fluctuating character of text phrases. By doing so, in the words of Pretorius, we avoid monotony and we lend dignity and grace to our performances. Over the years, I've come to love the expressiveness that syncopations and tempo flexibility give to music, how they seem to reveal the music's innate expressive character. I wish and hope the same for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schrock. And we all look forward to tomorrow evening when we present part four, phrasing and text underlay. Thank you again for watching.